Outline Podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Dwayne. This is your weekly discussion of all things entertainment, LGBT culture, and a piece of encouragement for everyone. Um, I have a very special guest on the show today. It is none other than writer, actor, activist, and playwright, Mr. Tell Tales, aka <laughs> Tariq Daniels, but it could be either or. It should have been Tariq Daniels, aka Mr. Tell Tales. You tell me. <laughs> Either one, uh, you know, like Brandon, Mr. Telltale, but yeah. They're interchangeable? Yeah, they're interchangeable, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for joining <laughs> the show today. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem. I have to tell all the listeners on the show that I am struggling with your first name. And <laughs> we, before the show started, I was like, okay, I'm going to say this. And I just could not say it right. So I'm going to have you <laughs> say your name for the audience. For <laughs> so it's um, Tariq. Yeah. Tariq. Yes, okay. yes, that's it. I'm, yeah. saying, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here reading it and I feel like I'm saying it right. He's like, nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. So you guys heard the man. That's how you say his name. But he's an amazing author. Uh, he has a book out right now called No Bond So Strong. So yes. let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. Tell me, if, if this, let's pretend that this is your elevator speech. What okay. do you want the listeners to know about your book? Um, definitely that is a, um, a book about um, friendship between four black queer friends growing up and trying to navigate, you know, through the next steps of their lives. So it's, um, it's a story of friendship and love between black queer friends. Very nice. Very nice. And you're from Detroit, right? Born and raised. Born and raised. Nice. Uh, and you currently reside in Texas? Yes. Austin, Texas. Awesome. How long have you been there? I've been here um, six years. Six years. Nice. Yeah. I've been yes. in Atlanta six years. I'm from Los Angeles. So wow. Absolutely. Yeah, I moved from Atlanta. Oh, nice. So you lived here. Mm-hmm. Okay. And mm-hmm. also, like, have you you've been here the last couple of weeks, it seems like. I was like, wait a minute. Who's here? <laughs> We're doing this via yeah. Skype. We probably could have done this <laughs> Yeah, there's been a lot going on in Atlanta and just promoting the book. So, yeah, I've been there uh, twice within the last month. Nice. That's great that you're getting your work out there. And it seems that people are really receiving it well. Like I, I follow you closely online. I see you posting the well wishes from people and people letting you know what your book has done for them and people holding your book. So congratulations on really making an impact with your words. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Really. That's awesome. That's mm-hmm. awesome. So what was life like for you? Um, I'm sorry. Actually, how do you identify sexually? If you don't mind me asking. Um, I am a queer man, gay You're man. A queer man. Okay, yes. cool. So what was mm-hmm. life like for you as a queer man growing up in Detroit? Wow. Um, life for me was um definitely being surrounded by friends, more so than family. Um, you know, growing up with um, a close knit group of friends of about twenty to 50, about twenty of us, you know, in a larger circle. And then, you know, of course, the closer we got, it was like, you know, team. then, you know, it was a, a real good core of four people. And basically, um, I was in high school because I left when I went off to college. So, you know, catching the bus, you know, in the city and, you know, you know, having fun with my friends, but also trying to navigate through making sure I graduated, and, you know, I had good grades and not let the, you know, gay life, you know, just suck me up dry and stuff. So it was just, you know, that battle of, you know, trying to, you know, stay school, you know, the straight and narrow way, but also, you know, maintain, you know, the, the life of my friends and, you know, being gay in Detroit. That's real. When did you mm-hmm. discover a love for writing? I discovered a love for writing probably the earliest memory is like middle school. You know, I used to watch, you know, like a lot of sitcom TV shows. And so I used to like create my own little shows and. You know, like one day, you know, my show's going to be on TV. So um, definitely like middle school. And then you know, I started doing theater in like high school, stuff like that. That's awesome. And I see you wrote quite a few um, stage productions, correct? Correct. Nice. Correct. And you were also mm-hmm. nominated for an award for that. 
Yes, that's, yes, yes. That means you're writing some good stuff, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying. You know, this is it's my passion of theater. It's my love. So um, I definitely spend a lot of time trying to, um, you know, get a good, you know, script and stuff out there. Um, I'm wanting to do more, you know, nation play, nationwide play. That's kind of the goal next. I've been doing mostly local stuff here in Texas. So. Nice, nice, nice. So, no mm-hmm. bond so strong. What, has that been considered for a play, or are you considering switching that the production, or are you just leaving that as a book for now? I, I'm leaving it for a book. You know, I get asked that all the time. I, I don't see um, that um, that space for no bonds in, in theater. I, you know, I want to do other things. You know, so I'm taking that and trying to you know create other you know uh, mediums of entertainment versus theater. So I. Don't think, don't quote me on it, you know, the <laughs> right opportunity, you know, the right opportunity came, of course, but it's not something that I have planned, like, currently, no. Okay, awesome, awesome, mm-hmm. awesome. So, in your book, this is um, Friendship Among um, Friends here. Tell mm-hmm. me about your your writing process. Like, how do you go about your character development? Um, well, with the book in particular, um, a lot of the, the elements are all real you know, events that happened at some point, whether it was with me and my friends or maybe some friends that I knew that I, I wasn't cool with, but I knew their story. And so with all this, you know, you know, basically 15 years of, you know, being gay and being in the life, I had a lot of stories that I wanted to tell. So it took, you know, time to try to figure out how we're going to tell this story, these stories rather through four characters. And so I basically had to I, I developed the characters first. Then I decided, you know, what was important to these characters to um, elevate, you know, their their character. You know, what would they need to say? What would they need to do? What would need to be their experiences? So I kind of narrowed it down, like well, what stories I wanted to tell and try to, you know, make it one linear story amongst these four friends. Nice, nice. So what was the what was your timeline? Like how long did it take you to put together the entire from from inception to writing to editing? What was the entire timeline for you? Well, about three years, you know, it was uh, it was kind of difficult actually finishing the book because a lot of the stories were like um, stories that were emotional for me. You know, you know, it deals with like death and, you know, I did lose friends growing up. So I, you know, it took me to a place that maybe that was sad for me, but I couldn't stay in that place long. So I would, you know, write about that. And then I kind of like put the book down, you know, because it was a moment that I didn't want to, you know, stay there. Mm -hmm. And then maybe months later, I pick it back up with another, you know, perspective, you know, a little bit more, a different kind of energy than the sad energy I might have put it down with. So about three years as far as the writing process and about a year to like the actual um, a year of the three years of actually like getting it, you know, self-published, and, you know, edited and, you know, getting it branded and stuff like that. That's not bad at all. Honestly, like that's actually mm-hmm. that's a good amount of time. There's so many people out there that you're probably inspiring because um, the people who start start books, they write the first mm-hmm. page or the first chapter, wherever and they are in their journey, and it doesn't always get to the end. So the fact that you had a period of time where even with you stopping and pausing and allowing time for self-care, you still got back to it and got it out. Yeah, I was so determined. <laughs> I swear, I was like, I have to finish, I have to finish, because I felt like that was like a a missing piece to like really continue to move forward. I needed like a product, you know, you can produce plays all the time, but sometimes, you know, it, it, it's easier to navigate through like a, a tangible product. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've definitely felt like uh, the book and I think it was therapeutic for me as well. So I just like, I had to finish it. Like if nothing else, I was going to finish the book, you know? Nice, nice, nice. So I picked up on something you said. You said that you had to, you know, stop when things got too emotional or you needed to take breaks from it. So that means you have a an idea of self-care. What does self-care look like to you? Well, definitely. Um, and it's something I'm battling with now. So I don't want anyone to think that, you know, I'm always taking the right decisions with self-care. You know, I think I'm pretty knowledgeable about the things that I need to do being a um, mental health advocate. But um, I don't always do the right thing. But self-care for me is, you know, just walking away from projects, walking, walking away from deadlines and just sometimes just doing nothing. 
And that is hard for me, you know, and I know it's hard for a lot of, you know, creators or a lot of people that's, you know, trying to, you know, make things happen. But sometimes I just have to do that, you know, um, and just relax and just chill. And so I think that's the main thing, self-care for me and something I don't do often that I just have to tell myself to do. You know, friends around tell me, like, just stop. Just, you know, you don't have to do nothing. And I see them quotes all the time. Like, you know, as a creator, you don't always have to be doing something. It's easier said than done. But that's that's my form of self-care, you know, just relaxing. You're absolutely right with that. You don't have to be doing stuff all the time because Mm -hmm. you want it to be organic. You want it to be Mm -hmm. authentic. And I think when we force things, it comes out in the in the product and you don't always want that so it's good that you take these breaks so in these breaks what are some things that you do in your downtime like what are things that hobbies or things that you like to enjoy outside of writing <laughs> well definitely i'm a, um i love the art so I, I love going to like art galleries i love to go on live performances i'm in austin texas so you know with the live music capital of the world so i love going to see shows you know i love to take time to support you know, other people and, and see their creative work. So theater, um, I love theater. So I, I love going to see plays. You know, I love to go to the club and turn up, of course, and um, hang out and do all the things. But a lot of art is really, you know, uh, stimulating me, you know, my mind and stuff like that. So I definitely like the arts, you know, my downtime, supporting everybody else and seeing, um, being visually or creatively stimulated. That's amazing. That's amazing. So what led you to Austin, Texas? Um, well, my sister was going to um, school here and I um, visited and then it just felt like a, um, a place where I can like tap into my creative, you know, mojo. In Atlanta, I wasn't doing as much. You know, I felt like a little stagnant. You know, I was focused on more so business and, you know, having fun. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't much uh, creativity coming out of me. So I needed to go somewhere kind of away from what I've known. And Austin definitely was, you know, nothing that I was familiar with. You know, never thought I would live in Texas. But being here allowed me to um, just explore, you know, different sides of me, you know, meet different kind of people and, you know, really challenge myself and um, just, you know, be, live, be simple, you know, not worried about, you know, what you got on or who you know and what you're doing. It's kind of like, you can kind of like live under the grid in Austin and so it's been a perfect place to, um, to, to write and, you know, chill. I can totally dig that. I can totally dig that. I felt the same way when I left California and moved here. I think sometimes you have to get out of, areas that you're used to or where there's too many distractions so i completely understand kind of finding a silo elsewhere and mm-hmm. really using that that downtime and the the lack of distractions to really knock out you know really good quality work so that makes mm-hmm. complete sense that's mm-hmm. so cool so with yeah. with no bond so strong what is the impact you hope to make well one of the biggest things that you know that was not necessarily bothering me, but one of the reasons why I wanted to necessarily do this book and this kind of book was that I felt like as, you know, gay youth, gay, you know, youth of color is coming up, they don't have really much literature outside of scholarly things or, you know, self-help things. We don't, we don't have a lot of black gay storytelling, you know, with, you know, someone 15 years old, you know, maybe questioning their sexuality, don't have a book, you know, within the last you know, 20, you know, 10 years, enough books. I ain't gonna say a book, it's some out there. I just wanted to add to that. You know, I wanted to impact the youth having something to read or people in college having something to read that that identify, you know, they could identify and connect with. So I felt there was a lack of storytelling for Black queer stories. So I just wanted to add to, you know, what's already out there and, you know, and continue to do that, you know, because, you know, I had Elan Harris, you know, I had James Earl Hardy. Of course, we often go back to James Baldwin, which is still relevant to this day. But when you Google it now, you're not going to get many black queer stories out there. You know, um, I think we have a big wave of, you know, self-help and reflections. And a lot of people were saying a lot of things to, you know, for black queer um, empowerment. But, you know, sometimes it's good to just pick up a book and go to another world that you, you're not a part of and identify and connect. And that's what I really wanted to 
you know, or to impact people that way. I absolutely agree with you on that. I was just talking to um, one of my good friends about that. I was like, you know what? There's an influx of um, self-help and memoirs and things of that sort. And that's great for the sake of healing. But yeah, you want that world. You want to sometimes you just want to read for enjoyment. And then you can also find yourself in these fictional places and so that's awesome and i was actually going to ask you that next i want to say what other authors um inspired you like who you know who did you read growing up so outside of elon harris and james bond were there any other authors that you really connected with growing up um as far as um, not queer you know of course i was a big you know eric jerome dickey um fan you know terry mcmillan you know i love i remember reading mama and i was like eight years old and I was way beyond yeah I should have been reading that book <laughs> but it was really you know interesting you know I just love you know storytelling I love, definitely love storytelling that um, you could relate to you know in some kind of way and so all of those um, authors um, definitely you know impacted me that I, I enjoy reading I definitely share some of those sim- similarities I remember my first time I read a book by Eric Jerome Dickey Mm-hmm. And it blew my mind because I, I didn't know a book could take you there. Yeah. And it was like a road trip and I was so bored. And then we went to like, we stopped at like a Walmart, you know, where you just stop on road trips. And I just saw this book and I just asked my mom if I can get it. My mom's like going to argue with me about a book. She's like, sure, you know. <laughs> right. And so I started reading it and then I was just glued. I was like, I didn't know that a book could do this like in this way. Because before then it was a school book. So it was like, okay, you read like Lord of the flies and the great Gatsby and all that stuff okay great that's cute but to mm-hmm. see a book dealing with African Americans and that was sultry and had like certain themes you're like oh wow this is lit <laughs> yeah <laughs> and just the power of that I think will open open me up to the beauty of writing as well and reading because it's like and so when Elon Harris came along for me it was like okay now I have this and I'm really represented in it it's not me just reading about these straight characters I have someone to write about these gay characters and yeah. now I can really see myself in it so that's definitely definitely a movement yeah definitely so as a creative um, you 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 write and you do is there any other um avenues that you want to explore with your brand um well yeah definitely i'm working on right now um the next chapter no bond so strong which is um a scripted podcast nice. so we're in, i'm in development of that right now and hopefully when i get that you know finished you know i'm going to try to shop around to some um you know, some queer black mediums, you know, you know, Slay TV, yeah, you know, I listening. Thinking, yeah. <laughs> I was like, as soon as you said, I'm like, Slay TV, yes. <laughs> you know, Slay TV, are you listening? And it's, you know, some other ones out there, you know, I'm just trying to, um, that's why when people always, you know, asking about the play and stuff, I was like, well, there's a few other things that I kind of want to do that's kind of now, that's different than what I've been doing. And I think um, the scripted podcast was really something, I'm, I'm a podcast fanatic, um, whether it's, you know, the murder mysteries or whether it's, you know, conversationals or but I really love. Um, I came across this one called Black Widow and like I was hooked on that one. I'm like, wow, you could tell a story like, mm-hmm. you know, like the 1940s, you know, CBS radio stations. And it's so and good. So, it's so good. It, it, yeah, it got me intrigued. So I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And so um, that's what I'm in development right now, turning the book into like a, um, a continuation of the book into a scripted podcast. That's amazing and very relevant. You're very mm-hmm. smart to do that. So I'll, I'm very excited to hear when it comes out. I can't wait <laughs> to see what you do with the characters. And that's really, really dope. Because I think what's so amazing about podcasting, too, and just audio format it is reaching backwards. But I, I always think about like how the generations before us, like our parents used to listen to like AM radio. And we were like, mm-hmm. why are you listening to talk radio? But our podcast has become our talk radio. Yeah. And I, I find myself wanting to listen to people talk all the time now. I'm like, okay, I need a podcast. I need something to keep, you know, even if it's an audio book, it's become, you know, just like this wave of knowledge. And so it's very smart for you to do that and also Mm -hmm. the working class person they want things to get through their day yeah (laughs) (laughs) that is so true i'll be at work i go through all of them you know um i listen to podcasts all day work really that's what i do 
Because, you know, you can't be, you know, video, you know. Mm. That's what I think what keeps me from YouTube as much because when I'm at work, you know, that I don't have the, you know, I'm not going to just be watching video about that work. So it's easier to be kind of discreet, you know, still be professional and listen, you know, listen to your podcast. Mm-hmm. So I th- it's definitely a, um, a convenience um, for the working, you know, working class. Absolutely. I-, I will say as a podcaster, it does put a lot of pressure on because if this show <laughs> is ever late or if I'm skipping it, people are like, wait a minute now, you messing up my routine. I'm like, I don't want to mess up your routine now. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, be a list. You have a list and you <laughs> wait on the new episode. Like, where is the episode? Yeah, yeah. I, that's how I am on Thursdays with the read. Like, I'm always refreshing. Just yeah. refreshing all day until it shows up. And I'm like, okay, they come on around 11, 30, 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is fun though because it kind of it, it is like a thing to do it's like we become part of your life really when you think yeah. about it like you know tv but not having to be watching tv and i think it also provides a level of connection and i'm gonna i'm gonna stretch this out a little bit but follow mm-hmm. me i feel okay. like we've lost a lot of connection with people with technology Mm -hmm. And if you realize everyone is texting all the time and people aren't actually talking on the phone anymore. And I feel like in a weird way, podcasting is providing that almost kind of phone element where you're just hearing people express themselves and Mm -hmm. it's almost like a connection that's there. And I think it's feeding that need that people don't even realize that they, that they're, that they desire. Yeah. So it's kind of like just hearing someone's voice. And we've really cut that out over the last decade. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's true. Talking on the phone is so foreign to people. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, oh, and I feel like podcasting in a way does that because there's a warmth in hearing people's voices and and interacting. And because of tech, technology has separated us so much that Mm -hmm. we're not always getting that. So it could be a part of that too. And that could be the reason why, you know, podcasts are so successful because we, we have, you know, um, lost the human touch, you know, and, and lost the connection with people on a daily basis. So, you know, I think that was a really good point you made. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I do. Mm-hmm. I talk about it all the time, though, with like technology. It, it, it's like I love technology, but it does concern me, like how we just keep getting new things that are separating us further. <laughs> Yeah, like, literally, that's like true. I remember, and I think that's the, the 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 blessing of being an aging millennial is that mm-hmm. I remember going to concerts with no phones, <laughs> like, right? And, like, <laughs> legit, just watching the show, and mm-hmm. now you're literally watching the show through someone else's phone that's in front of you, and you're like, yeah. oh my god, this is really a thing. I mean, it's great that we have access to cameras for obvious reasons, but it also mm-hmm. has a bad side too. So it's just it's it's a double edged sword with technology and. We keep coming up with things that are separating us further. I mean, video clips are only less are less in the minute. Everything has to be delivered very quickly. People don't want things to be too long. It's just like we're losing the like even something I think that drove me crazy is if you notice now online when an article appears like on Facebook or something, it tells mm-hmm. you the average read time on there now. Because right. people are like, I don't want to read something that's longer than two minutes. So it right. has to tell you how long the read is going to be because if it's anything longer than five or six, people are like, oh, and that's too long. And I'm like, damn, we don't even like reading anymore. <laughs> like Everyone's in a rush. Everyone's busy. Everyone's like, nope, this is too much. Can't do it. Yeah, the short um, attention span. Like you said, everything comes so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, the way things are produced, you know, you have to keep people's attention. You have to, you know, offer content, you know, such at a rapid speed. We Mm -hmm. think, you know, um, like you just said with your podcast, like, hey, every week we want your podcast, you know what I'm saying? And that should become part of our culture. And so, yeah, um, that is interesting that they tell you how long it take you to read the article. Mm-hmm. And even, I, it's wild. It's wild. <laughs> well, even in, honestly, even when I read a lot of books on Kindle, and because mm-hmm. I, I love the access of that. Once again, technology. I love an actual book in my hand, but mm-hmm. I also like saying, hey, I want to enter a new world today in reading. I can do it instantly on Kindle. Mm-hmm. But right. like, even the it tells you the um, how much time you have left in reading the book. It tells you how long the how many pages you have left in the chapter they even change the scrolling to where you don't actually have to flip the page you can just scroll <laughs> up you just scroll I, up. 
I just noted that too. You could just scroll up. Okay. I'm like, oh, okay. It's, it's an eternal like scroll. Document. It's an eternal scroll. You're just like, I'm going to keep scrolling until I get to the end, I guess. <laughs> and it's on one side is 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 great for the user, the user feature, you know, like you're enhancing it and making the experience better. But I'm like, damn, we are literally getting so lazy with everything. Like there, there's been times like I've been around people who have still have DVD players and still have DVDs and they're like, oh, I want to watch this movie, but I don't want to get up and put this DVD in. Let me see if I can find it online real quick. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> you own it. It's right there. It's right there. That but is so crazy. You scour the internet or you do whatever to find it because that's just too much work. <laughs> and it's just first world problems. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's and that is fun. It's funny, but it is what it is. Like even with the podcast, there's the attention span thing. I have some people who will say, "Oh my god, I love it when your show is 30 minutes because I can listen to it on my way to work and be done." But then there are some people who say, "Oh, I love it when your show is about two hours, an hour, two hours because I'm at work and it helps me get through the day." And I'm just like, "Which one is it? I don't know. Like, what what am I supposed to do?" So I kind of just toggle it. Every I just see how things operate because people are also very different. But it is a very much attention span thing there's a part where people say you're not giving us enough but there's also where saying you're giving me too much and it's always interesting finding that divide which also is a question for you when writing your book did you have like an idea in mind how long you wanted it to be um i wanted it to be based on even this conversation an easy read i wanted it to be um uh, around 200 pages or less. I did not want it to be because I knew that it was a continuation and I didn't want it to be where like people didn't feel like they can get through the book. I actually, like again, I was trying to, you know, reach the masses. And so it, it is definitely an easy read. And that was kind of my intention. You know, I wanted to get to the story that people want to know and, and keep it moving. Um, so yes, I wasn't trying to do like a Toni Morrison 500 page, you know, uh, you know, buy a, you know, pick book, but, um, yeah, I mean, you're right. People, um, attention spans, and, but then it is like, then you do get the people like, Oh, I want more, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, even as an author, I've, I've heard both. Like, oh my God, I was able to read that in, you know, one night or two nights. And then some people like, Oh, I'm ready for the next one already. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, calm down. You know, I can't just write books, you know, <laughs> that quickly. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but yeah, so I guess that's just really the um, satisfying the, the the consumer or people goes both ways. Like you're saying, some people want it longer, some people want it shorter. I feel like um, when you were saying like both, I think because sometimes I want to listen to a long podcast, you know, depending on the day. And sometimes I do want to listen to a short one. So I guess it just depends on, you know, my mood mm-hmm. mainly. Mm-hmm. I mean that's what it is. Society is very moody, and you just kinda, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's why it's just best, as you said, it's best to just do the work that you want to do, mm-hmm. and you'll find your tribe that enjoys your work. But mm-hmm. you can't force something. Like I can't force a show to be two hours. I also can't force it to be thirty minutes if mm-hmm. there's something that I want to I want to be complete about. You know, right. I'm not a big fan of having six parts of the same topic. Like, <laughs> I mean, so it's like I want to complete this, and some things allow for longer conversations. So it totally makes sense. But um, one thing I have learned, though, there's but I, I don't I don't think we have to be concerned about writing and reading ever going out of style though though attention spans are different writing will always be respected yes the medium has changed we don't necessarily do paper books as often we don't do newspapers as much as we used to because of technology people are still reading though people are still writing so it's Mm -hmm. not something that's going to ever be a lost art because if it became a lost art we would have a lot of illiterate people around and that's just not good for anyone so Mm -hmm. it's definitely i think a safe space to to be in so if you're out there listening and you're a writer keep writing keep doing you don't be concerned about the consumer so much as you should be concerned about the message you want to relay and the story you want to tell and being organic to yourself and i think that's what draws people is people just want real people they want to connect. They don't want things that are conjured up just for the sake of 
money really <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's that so you said that you um you do you said that might be a pod well there you're developing a podcast uh scripted mm-hmm. podcast so are there going to be future books maybe um definitely this was definitely just the beginning um I, i'm looking towards like the end of the next year um or maybe 2020 to have a book i'm not going to rush it like we were just saying you know organically but i know that you know i've already written the first line next book so you know it, it's definitely a sequel coming and you know and a lot of all of my work you know i've decided that it's going to be um, a lot of my work because it's you know heavily on you know black queer storytelling i feel like i want to create this world of the stories that i'm telling and you know and branch off to different things but keep it you know amongst this world i want to create like this world these people these friends and you know and they branch off into other things you know short stories but all coming from you know the center of my first book and so it's kind of like you know how like remember Eli harris books how he had every book and it was all you know kind of like some of the stories were different but like one character a pop-up mm-hmm. that was in the first one i love and that. the second one if I want to do that, but not just with books, you know, like I'm doing a podcast, mm-hmm. and I want to, you know, venture into short stories that spin off from the stories that I'm creating, you know, and then figure out other different ways to um, tell this story and different kinds of people. Because I wanted to be um, very representative of various types of people, you know, in the, you know, the black queer, you know, circle. You know, I don't want to just tell just one story. And that was very important for me why I also wanted to tell this story because so often, you know, we always hear about the DL lifestyle and that creeps up in almost every, you know, black queer story that we know, whether, you know, Moonlight, which I love, but again, it kind of puts you on that same idea with this guy who didn't know about himself and he was betrayed and, you know, that different stuff. I really want to emphasize that for me and like my friends growing up, we were out. I was out and gay at 14 going forward, you know? And so, so many times we don't hear the story of what it is to just live gay and be gay, even at a very young age, you know, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. You know, it's not something about um, being DL all the time. I feel like we, we, we have been pigeonholed in that, you know, stereotype of the black queer storyteller that you have to tell the DL side of it. Mm-hmm. But what if everybody was gay? We were all gay. We, I didn't have any DL friends. I didn't even know DL people until I got way grown you know when i was younger we were just all out and what's wrong with being black gay and out and so i appreciate and that that's the word i appreciate that that's the truth it's the truth like yeah that and even with elon harris it was always a level of like oh there's this guy who's not out i mean his yeah main, <laughs> his main character claimed bisexuality forever we like but you ain't never with no women stop right <laughs> the football player right. and Brazil, stuff like that basil, basil yeah mm-hmm. and even with um so you know since i've been saying i want to develop a, a scripted podcast i've been listening to you know trying to see what's out there and i ran across you know Issa Rae Fruit. Have you listened to that one? Yeah, I have listened to Fruit. Um, I'm, I've not gotten through the whole thing. It was a little hard for me to connect with, but I did listen like the first two. And it was that same rhetoric, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's why I'm just like, you know, as much as I appreciate it, we have to push you know, the, you know, the, the black queer storytelling to a more truthful and honest space. Yes, there are DL guys. Yes, there are bisexual guys. And yes, that is a part of, you know, the LGBT umbrella, but Tell the stories of the ones who didn't have that option and to also, be DL. Right. And also make it less salacious. I feel like mm-hmm. when people talk about black gay men, it's always salacious, it's always a scandal. It's always mm-hmm. like a hush hush thing. And it's like, yeah, that's not everybody's story. Like, mm-hmm. Some people, like you said, are just out and just living mm-hmm. their life. So I feel you on that. So I, I commend you for wanting to create things that represent that and they're not so monolithic. So that's super, super dope. But also, I like that you're creating a universe of mm-hmm. things and interconnected platforms because for someone who is a fan at the beginning you're actually creating a whole world for them. So mm-hmm. how amazing would it be to be a fan of yours and then you get this book 
Then you get this podcast that connects to the book. And then you get another short story that does that. Then the short story goes to another book like that. You're creating this world that people will really grow to love. It's kind of like how people go up for like Marvel and DC comics. Mm -hmm. It's like it's it's a whole thing where things, oh, this is from this one. This is for and you're doing that for your fans and your, you know, your your followers. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's really the idea of, you know, um, you know, take you know, doing what I can do, you know, and then, you know, add to that, creating that world of entertainment with, you know, I with characters and situations that people can identify. What I know, you know, I'm 33 years old. I've been out for a very long time, so I have a lot of stuff to say, you know, and a lot of stories um, in my mind. And so what other way is to keep it all connected and, you know, try to create that fan base and the buzz and, you know, the anticipation, you know, it keeps it kind of keeps you on your toes and it, and it kind of keeps you focused because I never know. I never have to worry about where I want to go. It's more so how to get there. And so um, that's a word. That's a word. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's yeah, I guess that's amazing, man. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah. this is great. So tell people where they can find you online. Um, definitely on Mister Telltales on everything. So that's M I S T E R T E L L T A L E S dot com. Mister Telltales on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Tumblr and it's a good Tumblr. Not a <laughs> oh, man. Not, it's not the, right. <laughs> it's not the Tumblr after the dark. Well, it's not after dark more, but right, um, it's just Tumblr. Now, right? It's just Tumblr, right? I, I just thought they had regular stuff on Tumblr. I said, oh. <laughs> They have, right, like, they, some they have like real stuff on here, like poems and stuff. Oh, shit. <laughs> Does that amaze you when you be on there and it pop up like, like, oh, that's a nice picture. Right. You know what I mean? You go into like real art and stuff like right. that. He's like, oh, I never knew. Or it interrupts what I was doing. I'm like, wait a minute. What is this? Like, this don't go with the thing. <laughs> right. That's not what I came up here for. <laughs> nice picture, though. <laughs> right. Right. That's beautiful. Nice roses. <laughs> well, I'm going to have all that info in the show notes so the listeners can just mm-hmm. click on the links and be sure to connect with you and also get your book and figure out where you're going to be because listen you're active you are active so i'm sure you'll have <laughs> updates of where you'll be next and that'll be great but i yeah. thank you so much for being on the show this is a really a cool um talk that we had about your stuff and i wish you the best thank you man and thank you for having me and and congratulations on your show i mean you're really working and consistent and um i'm following you as well so. thank you listen i'm out here i'm trying, I <laughs> trying but i appreciate it well guys that has been the outline podcast make sure you are subscribed sharing it with your friends please rate and comment and also follow me on all my social links which you can find in the show notes and if all else fails you can go to www.kevindewayne.com And with that said, I'll talk to you all next week. Peace out.